So, we are going to start a new topic from this lecture and this topic is also a very important topic uh, in AI. Namely, we will be studying reasoning under uncertainty. So, we have to brush up our uh, school funda on uh, probability. There will be quite a bit of probability coming up for you. So, let us get started. So, why do we need reasoning under uncertainty? So, let us see a few examples to get a clearer picture about why this is at all necessary. <coughs> Firstly, the problem of handling uncertain knowledge. Suppose we are given the rule that for all p, symptom p to take implies disease p cavity. So, this says that whenever one has a toothache, then that person has the disease which is a cavity in the tooth. Now, this is not correct because toothache can be caused in many other cases. Right? So, we cannot say that whenever we have toothache, it is because of cavity. So, if we have to actually analyze the case, the, the, the problem of toothache, then we have to comprehensively specify that what are the different causes for which this can happen. So, cavity is one, gum disease is one, impacted wisdom is one and so many other cases for which we can have a toothache. Now, enumerating all of these is a problem because all of these may not be known, right? And you can miss out quite a few. Like for example, you can have toothache also if somebody has hit you on the teeth, which you would probably not put in this rule, right? But for a diagnostic system, unless you have the complete uh, set of causes, then this rule will formally not be correct, right? Because we are using implication here. Let us try to model this in the other direction. So, suppose we want to say that for all P, disease P cavity implies symptom P toothache. So, we are saying that whenever there is cavity, then the symptom is toothache, right. But this is not correct either because all cavities do not cause toothache. So, even if someone has a cavity, that person may not have a toothache. So, these are the, this is a kind of scenario which is very difficult to represent unless we use some kind of uh, statement which says, okay, sometimes uh, uh, the cavity can cause toothache and if we have toothache, then sometimes it is because of the cavity, right. Now, what are the reasons for using probability? One is that without using probability, the specification becomes too large as we were seeing. That you have to explicitly enumerate the complete set of antecedents or consequence for a uh, exceptionless rule, which in practice is very difficult to achieve. It can also be because of theoretical ignorance. The complete set of antecedents is not known. We do not know what are the different kinds of diseases which can cause to take. And the third one is practical in ignorance, where the antecedents is known, but their truth is not known. So, if we do not have a mechanism of determining the truth of those antecedents, in practice we will never be able to apply those rules. So, to ha apply a rule, the antecedents will have to be there in the knowledge base. Now, if one of the antecedents is something which we cannot experimentally measure, then we will never be able to add that antecedent into the fact base and therefore, we will never be able to apply that rule, right. So, in the cases where something is difficult to uh, measure, we can leave that to chance hmm. based on previous experience about the percentage of 
cases where that actually happened. Before we come to the axioms of probability, let me uh, explain a few subtle points about this. See one thing is that when we are unable to model a set of rules exactly and completely, then we resort to things like probability. Right. People also have resorted instead of using probability to other kinds of logic like fuzzy logic. Now the, the difference between possibility which is part of fuzzy logic and probability which is the classical Bayesian analysis that we do, the, the difference is very subtle. For example, suppose we are talking about how the obesity of a person is related to cardiac diseases. So, we are saying that if, if the person is fat, then with certain probability that person uh, will have a cardiac problem. Now, when we are talking about a given person, then we have to talk about what is the probability that he is fat. Now, the scenario is that we do not, we do not know that person, we have not seen that person and based on some other information we have some certainty that yes, this person is fat with so much probability. Suppose we want to reason about the probability of cardiac diseases among Indian people. Now we have statistics about what fraction of Indian people are fat. So therefore, we can have a certainty or, or a probability that a given x is fat. right? And then with that, if we multiply it with the probability that if this person is fat, if x is fat, then x will have cardiac disease with say 90 percent probability, then uh, okay, let me write it down, it is becoming complex. Okay, suppose we know that uh, probability that um, This we know from the population of x. From Indians, if x is Indians, we know what percentage of Indians are fat. So, we know that if x is an Indian, what is the probability that he is fat? And then we are given that if x is fat, then x has uh, so let us call that c h d with probability of 0.7. Right. Then we ask that what is the probability that x has C H T. So this we can say that it is 0 0.2 times 0 0.7, right? Which is equal to 0.14. Right. Plus the case where x is not fat. Yes. Yes. Have the disease. Like point eight into point three plus. Plus. Point eight into point three. Why? Why should we have this? Sir, if x is not fat, mm -hmm. then also it has a probability of getting coronary heart disease. Yes. yes. Right, right, right. So, we also have to consider the case where x is not fat, but still has a heart disease, right. 
So, that case, that probability will also have to be added with this. Right? So, we will see how we do that analysis once we go into the Bayesian analysis. But the point I am trying to make here is that this is a probability that we are given and we can apply that to determine the probability of some other event. But fuzzy logic deals with a slightly different philosophy. There we, we can see the person x is given to us, right? but we are trying to say he is fat, but how fat? Okay, how fat? Fat is not a true true false value. You cannot say that the, that this person is um, that if the if the weight is above this, then in, then he is fat. If it, if the weight is below this, then he is not fat. Fat is actually a gradation. Right from thin to fat, we have a we have a distribution. Right. So fuzzy logic tries to reason in that sense. It it tries to look at the, the, the truth value not as Boolean, but as a value between 0 and 1. So, you say that x is very fat, then that means that the, the truth of x being fat is 0 0.8 and x is moderately fat which is 0 0.6 and so on. Right. Now, there you see it is not a question of whether x is fat or not. It is a question of how fat is x and the rules therefore, also has to be graded that way. Right. So, that is a different kind of analysis which people do. So, I just want to introduce it at the beginning because later on when we talk about these different kinds of reasoning, you have to be sure that which is what. So, one is probability and the other is the gradation of the truth. Hmm. axioms of probability. So, let me ask a simple puzzle. This is a this is a puzzle which goes like this that we are given that the probability that one person carries a bomb into the aircraft is 0 0.1, 0 0.1. 0 0.1 okay. So, probability that someone carries a bomb into the aircraft is 0 0.1, right. Then what is the probability that two people carry a bomb into the aircraft? So, it is 0 0.01, right. Now, one professor sees that okay, the probability of two people carrying a bomb into the aircraft is significantly lesser than the probability of one person carrying a bomb. So, what he does is he carries a bomb with him. He carries a bomb with him into the aircraft. So, the question is does that reduce the probability that another person will come up with a bomb? Right. So, why, why, why is that? what is the difference between these two? The difference is conditional probability. The probability that two people carry a bomb into the aircraft is this fine, but probability that another person carries a bomb into the aircraft given that one person has carried it is again 0 0.1. Right? So, that is what we, we have as conditional probability. So, the important thing is to realize that which events are independent and which are conditional to each other and that will be the core thing that we will that will form the basis of all our inferences. So, these are school book axioms of probability P A or B is P A plus P B minus P A and B right. Then we have Bayes rule, everyone remembers Bayes rule. Okay, so let us move into the next thing. Belief networks. Belief networks are networks with the following. We have 
a set of random variables as nodes. We have directed links, the intuitive meaning of a link from node x to node y is that x has a direct influence on y. cause effect relationship between these. Now, each node has a conditional probability table that quantifies the effects that the parent have on the node hmm. and the graph has no directed cycles, right. Because we assume that there is, uh, that there is a cause effect relationship between the events and there is no feedback. Uh, networks with feedback has been also studied, but in this particular lecture we are not going to consider that. Huh. Okay. Let us start with an example. So, this is an example where we have a burglar alarm installed at home. The alarm is fairly reliable at detecting a burglary, so th with some probability whenever there is a burglary, the alarm will go, hmm. it will ring. But it also responds at times to minor earthquakes. So, if there is a minor earthquake, then also the burglar alarm can ring. Actually, this particular example is due to Julia Pearl, uh, who was, uh, who is in, fa in fact a residence of uh, LA, Los Angeles and that is why he is interested in earthquakes. So, they have it quite frequently. Right. Two neighbors on hearing the alarm calls the police. John always calls when he hears the alarm, but sometimes confuses the telephone ringing with the alarm and calls then too. Right. And Mary likes loud music and sometimes misses the alarm altogether because of the music. Right. So, this is what we are given. So, we will model this as a belief network. So, this is a example of the <coughs> belief network. Slides please, slides please, yes. So, let us see what we have here. These are the events. So, burglary, earthquake, alarm, John calls and Mary calls. And this ordering that we have done is our choice of doing this, right. You can construct for the same scenario different belief network, the, but the correct one will have certain desirable properties. So, we will study this one first and then later on we will see that if we model the same thing in a different, uh, uh, in a different topology then we will get a different kind of probabilities. So, what this says is, it says that burglary is an independent event and the probability that a burglary occurs is 0 0.001. <coughs> probability that an earthquake occurs is 0 0.002, right. So, these figures are all from Los Angeles. The probability of earthquake is more than the probability of burglary. Then we have this alarm and this table tells us that given that it is a burglary and given that there is an earthquake, what is the probability that the alarm goes off. So, if both a burglary and an earthquake has taken place, then it goes off with 0.95 probability. If there is a burglary and there is no earthquake, then also with 0.95 probability the alarm rings. If there is no burglary, but there is an earthquake, then the alarm goes off with probability 0.29. So, the, so sometimes when there is no burglary, but there is an earthquake, the alarm mistakenly goes off. If there is no burglary and no earthquake, then the probability that the alarm goes off is very less 0 0.001, right. If you sum up all these probabilities, then you will find that you have 1. I think this should be 0 0.01, no? Zero point, 
wait, 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 wait. Just, just a minute. Okay, th these are for all these. Okay, if you, if these cases were exhaustive, then you would get one, right? If yes, if these cases were exhaustive, then you would get one. Hmm. But these are not always independent, so that's why uh, you will get this thing. Huh. This overlap is there. Okay. I'll come back to this and explain this later. This, okay. Here we have John calls, and uh, given the alarm takes place, the probability that John calls is 0 0.9, and uh, if the alarm does not go off, then the probability of John calls is 0 0.05 because this is when John mistakes the telephone ring to be the alarm. And when we look at Mary calls, then when there is an alarm, then Mary calls with 0.7, the remaining 0.3 is because of the music, yes. And when there is no alarm, then also Mary might call, but with a very small probability, right. So, this is the belief network. Huh. Now, how do we use this network to, first we will see how we can use this network to answer different kinds of queries and we will also see how we can construct this network. Now, the joint probability distribution of a set of variables is given by this. Now, let us see what we mean by this. The probability that uh, we have a, that that x 1 through x n take a given value is given by the probability of each x i given that the parents have taken place. Right. Let us see an example. Probability of the event that the alarm has sounded, but neither a burglary nor an earthquake has occurred and both Mary and John call. Right. So, let me write this down here. So, I have probability of John calls and Mary calls and there is an alarm, but no burglary and no earthquake, right. So, what we will do here is, we will start breaking this up as follows. We will break this up as probability of J given A, right, and times probability of okay. Why J given A? Because if you recall in the in the belief network that we had here, uh, slides please. In the belief network, slides please. In the belief network that we had here, slides please. In the belief network that we had here, we had uh, <coughs> J, only alarm was the predecessor of John calls. So, that is why for the probability of John calls, only given the alarm is what is relevant. Okay. So, we have here P j given A and then P m text please. Given A because Mary calls given alarm and then probability of A given not B and not E and then times probability of not B and probability of not E, right. So, it is the, uh, it is the product of all these. Hmm. So, what does this mean? This means that when I have a set of uh, literals here, 
then the probability of the conjunction of this in the belief network is given by the probability of each of those events given the values of the <coughs> predecessors of that those in the belief network. Right. Now, if some of these was missing like if A was not there then also we will have to bring this here and then reason about probability of A. Right. So, if we just wanted to know about probability of J for example, then we will have to first look at probability of J given A times probability of A. Yes, and, and also for not A, right. Then uh, plus probability of J given not A, right, times probability of not A. Now, in this case, because we were given A, so that is why these terms disappeared, right. So, we had we will have this and then again this probability of A will be broken up similarly in terms of the probability of A given uh, what were the predecessors of A? B and E. So, B and E then probability of A given not B and E probability of A given B and not E and so on, right. We have to break it up like this and analyze them, right. So, the idea is that for any event if we have to compute the probability, then we have to compute it in terms of the predecessors of these events in the belief network, right. And those probability values are the ones that are given in the table. For example, when we have P j given A, so that probability is given in the belief network. So, if you look at the belief network, then uh, probability of j given A is 0 0.9, right. So, for this we will take, a, take this down as 0 0.9 times probability of m given a, m given a here is 0 0.7 and then if you look at this probability of a given not b and not e, not b and not e is this one 0 0.001, 0 0.001 probability of not b is what 1 minus 0 0.001 right and probability of not e is 1 minus 0 0.002 right hmm. slides please Here, text yes. No, no, this is not product. This this will also have to be done with P, B, and D, and then plus with right. Right. So, so now this makes sense that when we have the joint probability distribution of a set of events, then what we have here is the product of the p x i given parents of x i hmm. for each of them. Right. So, 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 like the use of 
Yes, the belief network is attempts to model the cause effect relationship between the events along with their probability values, right. So, there are two phases in, in this reasoning. The first phase is to learn or the model the belief network. How do we do that? One way could be that we know the events and we know the cause effect relationship between the events. Suppose for a medical diagnostic system, the doctor tells us that this is, if this happens then that will happen with so much probability and so on and we just write it down in the form of a belief network, right. That is one way of constructing the belief network. And then when we actually do the diagnostic and we want to find out that if that person has fever, then with what probability does he have leukemia, right. Then we can find out those probabilities by analyzing the belief network, right. That is uh, the, the use of the belief network. But there has been also a significant amount of research on learning of belief network from experimental data. And one of the most interesting work that has been done in the last couple of years is on the following thing, that if you have a genome, a genome is a, is the DNA sequence that we have and uh, th there is a thing called a DNA microarray with which you can do experiments and find out that for a given sample, which are the genes that are being expressed, right. So, suppose we take a cancer patient and we analyze for a given protein injection that what is the set of genes that are being expressed, right. So, we have some 20 samples of them. So, we know that these, 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 these genes have been expressed. And similarly, we have for the healthy people also a set of genes which are being expressed, right. Then what we try to do is, we try to find out cause effect relationships between these genes, because expression of one gene produces some protein which in turn causes some other gene to express, right. For example, when we are born, we are born with only one cell, right. And that cell multiplies and creates all the organs, etcetera. How does this happen? It happens because there is a genetic pathway through which it happens. So, uh, depending on what we have in the cell sap, certain genes will express more at that time. There are genes in our body which are expressed only during uh, the first couple of weeks of our fertilization and th thereafter they are not expressed anywhere, anytime in the future. Huh. So, what happens is those genes will express, they will create some proteins which will cause other genes to express and slowly this sequence of expressions will cause the entire uh, organism to develop. So, there is a lot of research to model these in terms of base networks huh? and to discover that what is this cause effect relationship. So, what are the steps that we have to do there? we have to first decide which way the links will go. We have the set of events, the events are this gene expresses, this gene expresses etcetera. But we do not know what is the, which causes which. So, one thing is to learn the direction of those links and the other is to learn the probabilities of those links. Hmm. So, so, learning that from experimental data is a subject on its own, which we will not address into in detail. But once we have the belief network, then we can always reason and find out the probabilities of more complex events from the belief network, which is we, what we will study in more detail. The key feature of the belief network is conditional independence. Hmm. Now, we have noted here, okay, let me go back to this slide. We have noted here that 
the joint probability distribution in a belief network is given by probability of x i given the parents of x i right and take their products then you will get the probability of x 1 through x n right. Now, how does that come from? Where does that, that formula come from? It comes from here. So, I start with p x 1 through x n. So, I can use Bayes rule to break it up like this. Then I can use Bayes rule on this part to again break it up like this. Hmm? So, this one will again break up into x n minus 1 given the remaining ones and the probability of x n minus 2 through x 1 which recursively can get broken down and then we will have this as the result. Right? Now, what is this ordering that we have? This ordering of the variables is the is one topological order of the belief network. So, the larger indexed variable is towards the bottom. Okay. So, when I am analyzing x i, then all these x i x 1 through x i minus 1 are all variables which are topologically having a lesser number than x i. Right? So, this set of variables is the superset of all those variables which can influence the value of x i, but all these are not going to influence x i, not directly. I can express the cause, the, the cause of x i expressing in terms of the parents of x i in the belief network. So, the belief network tells me that okay, it is these parents of x i whose values are instrumental in determining the value of x i. Right? You could have transitively other factors influencing it transitively parents, parent, parents, parent and any ancestors like that. But if I knew the values of the immediate parents, then I can get the probability of x i by looking up the probability table that, that is there in the belief network. So, those of these which are not parents of x i can be dropped because this term is going to remain the same and that is what we mean by conditional independence. Right? So, it, it means that this term can be simplified to just the parents of x i. P x i given parents of x i. Right? So, that is the conditional independence and that makes our analysis much simpler than having to do with all the variables together. Okay. So, how do we construct the network? I will I will just outline this today and we will discuss it in more details in the later classes. Choose the set of relevant variables x i that describe the domain. That is the selecting the set of events. Choose an ordering for the variables. This is very important. The ordering has to be such that we have the cause effect relationship in the proper direction. But what happens if you choose an incorrect ordering? We will discuss that later. You will still be able to construct a belief network, but there will be certain problems. We will come to that later. Then, while there are variables left, pick a variable x and add a node for it. Set parents of x to some minimal set of existing nodes such that the conditional independence property is satisfied. So, a minimal set which such that I can write probability of x given all its predecessors is equal to the probability of x given its parents. So, that is what we mean by conditional independence and then define the conditional probability table for x. Right? This can be given or it can be extracted from the experimental data. Now, see this step 2 
is the most important step. If you are able to do this properly from your existing knowledge, then learning the pro conditional probability table is much easier because then you can actually just check out what is the probability of x given the parents of x by just analyzing uh, experimental data. Hmm. But if you do not know this ordering and if this ordering is incorrect, then also you will get conditional probability tables, but they will not be. What will happen is that this set of parents of x is going to be very large and the larger the parent set of x, the larger is the size of your conditional probability table. If you have two parents of x, then you have four entries in the conditional probability table. If you have 10 parents of x, then you have 2 to the power of 10 entries in the conditional probability table. So, if you have the ordering appropriately done, then you will find that the number of parents of x for every x will be limited, otherwise it will become very large. So, we will see in the next lecture that how we are able to deduce this to, to, to some extent. A young nation aspiring to find ways to fulfill a dream lays the foundation of an institution that will give aspiring technocrats the license to fly high. The first Indian Institute of Technology is born at Kharagpur. Founded on the basis of the recommendations of the NR Sarkar committee that was set up in 1945 to consider the development of higher technical institutions in India, the institute was first established in 5 Esplanade East, Kolkata, before it moved to Kharagpur in 1951. With Sir Gyan Chandra Ghosh as the first director and Dr. B.C. Roy as one of its founding guardians, the institute established itself as the symbol of a young, dynamic and resurgent nation. As top students rub shoulders with the most celebrated of professors and scholars, visions took shape. And IIT Kharagpur continued to play the pioneering role that was envisaged for it, enabling India to become a knowledge powerhouse that it is today. At every stage of its evolution, IIT Kharagpur remained ahead of its times. It provided the best of facilities for the budding technologists helping them shape their own as well as the nation's future. Indeed, today IIT Kharagpur has blossomed into a time-tested, venerable institute of learning. With the rich experience of converting individuals into brilliant professionals through 50 glorious years. As you cross the campus gate, you feel the distinct nip that is IIT Kharagpur. The spirit of objective inquiry and lateral thinking hangs heavy in the air. The modern township-like campus of IIT Kharagpur set in sylvan surroundings is self-sufficient in all respects. From modern banks to the good old post office, from vast playgrounds and well-equipped gyms to modern auditoria and open-air theatres, and from the quiet fibre-optic-linked residential quarters for the faculty to the web-enabled hostel rooms for the students. 
at IIT Kharagpur, lush green bowers of tranquility coexist with smart cards and ATMs. Spread over 690 hectares of sprawling cyber habitat, 120 kilometers from Kolkata, IIT Kharagpur is one of the largest network campuses in Asia. Just the academic complexes itself spreads over a built-up area of about 2 million square feet, of which 150,000 square feet is the new complex that commemorates the Golden Jubilee celebrations. And that's not all. It is the only IIT to have conquered territory beyond its own through cutting-edge courses offered in its extension campuses at Kolkata and Bhubaneswar. IIT Kharagpur is not just about its large campus, but its diverse range of activities. It offers the widest spectrum of disciplines, ranging from aerospace, biotechnology, cryogenics to architecture, mining and agricultural engineering supported by strong faculties of sciences, humanities and management. There are more than 30 departments and centers that offer the largest number of undergraduate and postgraduate courses amongst the IITs. The courses are ever-evolving and show the way for other sister institutions. The richness in its diverse activities is showcased by the technological support the institution provides in areas like architecture, agriculture, post-harvest technology and medical sciences. The institute has revolutionized and popularized rice milling technology. The other major contributions of IIT Kharagpur have been in the critical fields of defense, railways, space research, power systems and petrochemicals. All these activities directly empower the human requirements of the nation. Advanced facilities at the Institute make it possible to undertake cutting-edge research and service-sponsored research projects. The array of equipment ranges from aerodynamic testing laboratories to intelligent machining centers, atomic spectrometers, to VLSI design labs, molecular beam epitaxy, to anechoic chamber, fast protein liquid chromatographs, to liquid nitrogen plants. The cutting-edge technologies are at par with the best research facilities across the globe. In fact, the volume of research and development activities at the Institute is incredible. In terms of the number of patents it owns, the volume of industrial consultancy it provides and the revenue that it earns from all these make IIT Kharagpur a class apart and strengthens its position as the true pioneer in technological education in India. The Institute Library deserves a special mention. Fully web-enabled, it is one of the largest in Asia with over 324,000 volumes of material, including books, videos, microfilm and patent documents. that ensure a student's mind develops at the right pace. Along 
with its strong sense of academics, which is ensured by a strict selection process, life at Kharagpur is a celebration of, well, life. And at its heart are the students. In fact, the saying goes that you can take an IITN out of KGP, but not KGP out of an IITN. You've left a part of you behind. For most of the students, life in the campus was in itself a festivity, a collage of activities that shape their mind and body, a collage of events that was a synthesis of competition and cooperation, a collage of interests as diverse as dramatics and ham radio. Yes, life at Kharagpur has always been exciting. And the years cemented lifelong bonds as lives mingled over cups of joy and stretched over stimulating semesters. The halls with their blocks and wings connected by charming catwalks remain ensconced in their own world. A collage of memories. Infrastructurally adequate, architecturally meticulous, and holistically inspiring where students, wherever they might be from, invariably come into their own, developing their individual talents, honing their skills to take on challenges with confidence, so they can move ahead in fulfilling their dreams. What makes IIT Kharagpur so unique is its environment undiluted by the diversions of metropolitan surroundings the close-knit campus life enhances the entrepreneurial and innovative spirit of the achievers to be in an environment that is so stimulating it is only natural that down the years iit Kharagpur has consistently produced well-rounded individuals Many of them are celebrities in their own right. Holistic grooming has had a lot to do with this. So, no matter which walk of life they choose, the IIT KGPite stands tall. And so does the institution that bred him in majestic splendor. The alumni of this institute command global respect. Their distinguished presence at the helm of global giants is a matter of national pride. For the students of IIT Kharagpur, it is impossible to erase any scratch of memory about their alma mater. In fact, some come back to invest sentiment, pride, and money. To see the institute they call home rise to even greater heights, structurally, functionally, as well as holistically. Their singular aim is to make IIT Kharagpur an institute whichever way you look at it par excellence. A man's journey into quiet accomplishment and the Hall of Fame starts with the right step. And the training and placement cell of IIT has been the efficient facilitator in this regard for over 30,000 graduates. Having placed more than 95% of its students in a wide range of industries, consistently for over two decades, it is no wonder that the Institute is the most preferred campus for technical recruitment of quality manpower. 
with infrastructure like industrial power and communication facilities in addition to its excellent research and consultancy facilities step or science and technology entrepreneurs park aims to assist the budding entrepreneur into a successful adventure capitalist guiding him right from the concept institutional financing production leading up to the launch and marketing of the product. With its rich pool of talent and excellent infrastructure, it is no surprise that through the last three decades, IIT Kharagpur has developed strong liaison with the industry. SRIC, or Sponsored Research and Industrial Consultancy Cell, was formalized as the Special Industry Interaction Cell in 1982, devoted full-time to handle industrial projects and consultancies and for deploying and propagating intellectual property. Successful sponsored research projects straddle a wide spectrum, ranging from computers, communication and biotechnology to robotics, photonics and food processing. The setting up of a state-of-the-art VLSI CAD laboratory and tie-ups with GE in areas ranging from vehicle structure design to electrical communication and software technologies are excellent examples of IIT Kharagpur's ever-evolving pioneering spirit. Collaborations with a host of national and industrial majors are a testimony of its proven expertise and research repertoire. the celebration continues, Pandit Nehru would surely have been a proud man today. For him, IIT Kharagpur was always more than just an institute of technology. In his own immortal words, it is indeed a fine monument of modern India. <laughs> 